looking at the account of the rich young ruler. It's in Matthew chapter 19, and I'm going to uh, read it through beginning at verse 16. Matthew chapter 19, beginning at verse 16, the account of, as we usually remember him, the rich young ruler. Matthew 19, verse 16. And behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then could be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, See, we've left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. There is the Scripture's account, God's word of the rich young ruler, which we will continue to look at now. Let's uh, come before the Lord in prayer and ask him to bless the ministry of his word. Father, we do thank you for the scriptures. Here is this book. We hold it in our hands. We're able to read it. You, our creator, have revealed yourself to us. That is a a miracle beyond our comprehension, and, and, and yet, here you've done it. You've spoken to us. You've spoken to us through your prophets long ago. You've spoken to us in your Son as he came into this world, and now you've spoken to us having put it all into this book that is authoritative and that is without error inspired by your spirit and so father we pray that you would give us the ability to understand your truth hearts that desire to love it and obey it and we pray this all in christ's name amen <clears throat> i wanted to remind uh, those of you that come on wednesdays for the women's study that uh, we will be meeting again now we've resumed and we'll be meeting again this Wednesday at 10 a.m. here. And uh, just for information for people that are online or following on Wednesdays, we're going through this two-volume set by, uh, um, well, actually this one is actually by C.H. Spurgeon and his wife put it together. Uh, it's a two, It's a two-volume set by Banner of Truth. And it is well worth owning and reading. It's, a, it's not just a story. It's amazing how much uh, doct sound doctrine and practical application of Scripture you can, um, 
you can glean from reading these biographies like this. And so this is a, a very, very good one. You can get a, a shorter version as well, but usually you, you miss out when you do that. So this is the two-volume set, C.H. Spurgeon Autobiography uh, by Banner, by Banner of Truth. And you can get it on, uh, on M Amazon. All right, then let's come back to the, we just kind of introduced the rich young ruler last time, and it's gonna it'll take us probably one more uh, Lord's Day in order to finish up this account. It's a very, it's a very Im important one. Um, what I'm going to do uh, as we begin is, uh, specifically we wanna ask this morning, why did Jesus deal with this man as, as he did. And I want to provide you with some background that's, that's important for us uh, to know before, before we do this. Jesus, Jesus tells him, if you would enter life, keep the commandments. And then he quotes some of those, some of those commandments from the, from the Ten Commandments. And, uh, and he tells him, keep, keep these commandments and you'll, and you en you'll enter life, you see. Why? I mean, of all people, here's Jesus come to be the, the Savior and to establish the new covenant by faith alone. And why is he dealing with this young man uh, in, in this particular manner? And the way that I want to set the background to answer that question is to, uh, I'll be definitely overlapping with uh, much of what Craig's been teaching us in the, in the Sunday school class in regard to the, the covenants, because that is the explanation, a correct understanding of the covenants of Scripture, the law and the gospel, is, uh, it provides the answer to why Jesus is dealing with this man in the way that uh, he is. So, so let's just kind of uh, lay a foundation here and start with some, some basics then about uh, about the really the, the nature of this book that we call the Bible. We have uh, two major divisions in our Bible, right? The Old Testament and the New Testament, or you can call them covenants. What's a covenant? A covenant is a contract. You'll find people that try to say a covenant's different than a contract and so on. They usually try to do this in regard to marriage and argue that, well, it's a covenant and you can't ever break that and so on. But a covenant and a contract, they're, they're the same thing. And these two covenants are the way that God deals with human beings. We call, you can call it a testament uh, as well. And so here's our Bible organized into these two major divisions, the Old and the New Testaments. And, uh, and we need that, that's where we need to begin if we're going to understand uh, the Bible and God's dealings with us in, in His Son. Now, uh, you think, well, Okay, God, here's God, and he deals with his creatures, us, uh, through covenants, all right? So I just need to believe that, and we do need to believe that. that is the, that's how God does deal with us. But it really isn't quite so strange, because we utilize covenants all the time in, in our relationships. You can think of lots of examples. A business contract is a covenant. When you buy a home and you get a loan for them, your mortgage at the bank, that, that is a, a covenant. When you buy a car, you finance the car. Um, even, if, even if you pay cash for the car, there's, kind of, there's paperwork involved and in, 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 in agreement. Uh, there's marriage contracts. And we have all kinds of informal, unwritten contracts as well. In your relationship with, uh, let's say, uh, a, a friend of yours, all right? So you have a friend. There's certain understandings that, uh, that, that bless the relationship or which, or which don't, all right? So contracts are in, in human relationships are very, very common. Well, in the Bible, then, what we have is these two major contracts, and they, they're called different terms, but let's call them the law, what the Bible calls them, the law and, and the gospel. All right, the, the gospel is referred to also by other terms like faith or, or promise or, or grace. 
Now, what I want to do here is read some examples of the Bible talking about these two covenants. And in this, uh, this is kind of an introduction because I know that from what Craig has said, he's going to deal with it. He'll no doubt deal with these passages, too, in more detail than we will here. But what I want to show you here is that it really is true. The Bible consists of two distinct covenants. We'll see a way in which they're complementary, but they are nevertheless distinct. Okay, so, but we'll just keep this simple. Note what kind of language the Bible uses to talk about these, these covenants and... Uh, and know what it says ab about each one. We don't have to get real detailed about it, but just to get the big picture. Okay, here's a classic passage. You've all heard this before. Jeremiah 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. Now you see what I mean is you follow, try to get the big picture here. Clearly here, he's Jeremiah, the Lord through Jeremiah is talking to us about how many, two covenants, right? Two covenants, and they're not like each other. So, all right? For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So it's much different than the prior covenant that was written on tablets of stone. Now, we know that when he's talking about making that new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, that he's talking about the church, in, in, in the elect in, in the new covenant, because the uh, apostle to the Hebrews takes that very passage and says that's what it means. So here we have it in Hebrews 8. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. There again, you see, old covenant, there's a new covenant, and they're different. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second covenant. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold the day, and here he's quoting from Jeremiah 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish, what? A new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant, old covenant, that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant, the new covenant, that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one, what? First covenant, obsolete, and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So there, you know, there's one of those scriptures that, that just screams at you, make a chart. You know, compare and contrast, right? And how, as how they are all, they're all different. Two covenants there, uh, the old and the new. Galatians chapter 3. For all who rely on works of the law. Now here's the other, another very common scriptural term for the old covenant, right? The works of the law, the law. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it's evident that no one's justified before God by the law. For, quote, even the Old Testament says, Habakkuk here, the righteous shall live by faith. But the law, the Old Covenant, is not of faith. 
Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. How? By becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, promise, might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Okay? Two covenants, very different. Galatians 3 again, starting at verse 21. Is the law, the old covenant, is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, and the old covenant could not give life, the law couldn't give life, it only cursed, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith, and that's another term, as, you, as Craig's been teaching us, that's another term for the new covenant, only it's, it's in its pre-establishment language. Promise, promise by faith, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, right, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, now that the new covenant is established, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring heirs according to promise. So you see there then that the, the promise running through the Old Testament and it's realized, it's given in Christ, in, in the new covenant. Galatians 4, starting at verse 21. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? No, you, everybody, you want to be, you say you're good enough, like the rich young man. You say you're good enough and everything's going to work out. God is pleased. You're not perfect, but God is pleased with what, what, what uh, Paul is telling, telling such a person. He's saying, don't you listen to the law? Don't you listen to the law? The law is how God uh, defines what is good, who is good. It's written, Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise, Isaac. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These two women, these women are two covenants. Here's the language, you see. These women are two covenants. One, Mount, given at Mount Sinai, the thunderings of the law under Moses, right? Bearing children for what? What are all the children? They're slaves. Slavery. You're never going to be adopted as a son through the law. She is Hagar. Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present, it means earthly, Jerusalem. For she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above, the kingdom, is free. She's our mother. For it's written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you, brothers, he's talking to believers here, like Isaac, are children of promise. Isaac was born not of man's own doing, right? It was a miraculous birth, right? God did it. And so it is for all of us who are regenerate in Christ, but just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. 
So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. So what, he, what he's saying there, be done with the old covenant. Be done with it. Its purpose is civilians. Again, Christ has come. Embrace Christ. This is, this, this is the new covenant by which we become, we become heirs, you see. Incidentally, I have no doubt at all that um, the trouble and divisiveness and infighting that you so often see in local churches is due exactly to, um, to this, and that is, but just as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted Isaac, who was born according to the spirit, so also it is now, right? Hypocrites, false Christians, people who are who claim to they, you know they make some profession of Christ and even church member whatever they always 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 persecute Christ's true people it always always happens they, 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 and, and you can you can count on that Romans chapter three again note the language now we know that whatever the law says so you're this the law you know, whatever the law says it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, the nature of the old covenant, works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there's no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Okay, so there, you just, I've just kind of unloaded on you a lot of uh, New Testament well, and some Old Testament language about these two, uh, two covenants, works of the law. Righteousness of faith, you see, works and grace and law, law here and promise and all, all those terms showing in, in, in these passages and more are very, very clear that these are two absolutely different covenants and that we're to be done then with, with, the, with the old one. We could go on and on with many more references just like that. Now each covenant... The law and the gospel, the law, and I should say the new covenant, the old covenant, the new covenant, was established with a specific purpose, right? The law, what does the law do? We saw it in one reference there. It points man to his sin and to his need for Christ. <clears throat> what is the effect of the law on the sinner? What is it? Paul says that the law is the power of sin. It, that's pretty incredible. The law is the power of sin. I'm going to be justified by good deeds. I'm going to, do, I'm going to obey the Ten Commandments. I'm going to do, no, no, no. The Ten Commandments empower your sin. What's going to happen is you're going to sin all the more, you see. It is, it's the power, it is the power of, of, of sin. And so, and in fact, that is one of the purposes of the law, to empower our sins so that we can see it. We, we see our, our sin. Here's a couple of things to understand about the two covenants. First of all, and I hope this is the right term, there might be a better term, but they are complementary yet completely incompatible. Okay? They are complementary, but they're in, completely incompatible. If you say, for example, if someone says, well, the old and the new covenant, the law and the gospel, are totally, absolutely separate, and you can never have any of the law in, uh, you don't even want to talk about the law as a Christian, hence it's gone, well, then you're crossing over into what we would call dispensational theology. But the law and the go 
gospel, the old covenant and the new covenant, are complementary, but they are completely incompatible. And I'll explain that more in, in a moment. I think most of you probably understand that already. But secondly, the law is not of grace. It only condemns. The gospel is of grace, and it does not condemn those who are in it. There is therefore now no condemnation for them, those who are in Christ Jesus, and it justifies the sinner by faith. Now, I thought we were talking about the rich young ruler. Well, as we'll see in a moment, I need to say a couple of more things, but as we'll see in a moment, if we're going to understand why Jesus deals with the rich young ruler here as he does in Matthew 19, we, these are the things that we have to understand, all right? The law and the gospel are complementary in the sense that the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, the scriptures, um, pointed to Christ. They, they pointed sinners to Christ. The law empowers their sin. It shows them, the sinner, his need for Christ. There are all, you know, there's all those types and shadows and symbols in the Old, in the Old Testament. The Old Testament sacrifices, the blood sacrifice, the whole thing. It's, it's pointing people, pointing people to, to Christ, you see. But even though they're complementary, they are completely incompatible and they must never be confused and mixed together. There's an old covenant and there's a new covenant and they are not alike. They are not alike as Jeremiah and Hebrews tells us. Let me show you, this, this is a curious little parable that Jesus told, but it makes sense when you understand that he's, he's uh, teaching us that you can't mix the old covenant and the new covenant, okay? Uh, Matthew 9, the disciples of John, disciples of John the Baptist. Now remember, John the Baptist was the last of the Old Testament prophets. And Jesus said that he was the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. The reason was because John, John's message was the greatest. And his message was the greatest because he was fully and completely able to say, that one, there he is. He, there is the Messiah, okay? And this, this, this end of the old era, Old Testament era, and introducing the new, but he was of the old era, and he was, uh, he was an Old Testament prophet. And so the disciples of John come to Jesus, and they say, why do we and the Pharisees fast but your disciples do not fast. And, and essentially what they're saying is, I think, is how come we're keeping the law and you're not in respect to these, this fasting? And they're, and they're right, rightly, you can understand why they're, they're confused. What, what, what's going on? Now Jesus did not come back to them and say, well, let me show you how you guys and John fit together with me and my disciples and we're going to create this, this new religion here out of the two. He says exactly the opposite. Look at this. Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast. No one, here's really the principles here, no one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. What's, what's he saying there? You don't take the you don't take my new covenant, you don't take the new covenant, you don't take Christ and um, that like like a new piece of cloth unshrunk and patch it on to the old covenant. You, you don't do, it'll be, a, it'll be a disaster, a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put in old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins and so both are preserved. The gospel, the new covenant, is new wine. You 
don't mix it together with the Old Covenant. You cannot inject it into the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant pointed to it, but then the Old Covenant was done. It passed away, you see, and, and, and now all things, all things are new then in, in Christ. The Old Covenant is not to be perpetuated. This explains, for example, the whole thing about the temple, Matthew 24. Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, You see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. So even the, all the trappings of the Old Covenant gone, obliterated. They were, not to be, they were not to be perpetuated, you see. Again, John chapter 3, John the Baptist answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it's given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. Now, actually, that's a pretty good statement. I think you've heard me say before, John the Baptist was the Old Testament personified, in, in a way. So when he's saying, I'm not the new covenant, I'm not the Christ, but I, the old covenant, have been sent before him. Okay, you see that? Does that make sense? So, so he's announcing, he's pointing to him. Then he goes on, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom, Christ, the friend of the bridegroom who stands hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. So the old covenant is the friend of the new covenant, but they are incompatible. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. Now, and here's the punchline. He must increase, but I must decrease. And what John means by that is Christ and the new covenant must increase now. Me and the old covenant must go away, right? To be, to be done. Hebrews 8, in speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what's becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Right? So the old covenant vanished away. All right, then, with that background, I think we can better understand the mindset of not only this young ruler that comes to Jesus, but also the mindset of the Jews that... At that present at that present time in Jesus day and uh, next week I'm, I want to look more closely at the you know why such a shocked reaction by the disciples when after this man had gone away sorrowing because he had all this money why were the disciples so shocked when Jesus said it's it's impossible with man to enter it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Why, why were they so shocked, so taken aback? And I think it has to do something with who this rich young man, who was it? What does it mean? He was a ruler, to be a ruler uh, of, of the Jews. But for now, let's just, let's review what Jesus told him in uh, verse 16 to 20. Behold, a man came up to him saying, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, why do you ask me about what's good? There's only one who's good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. Now you see my point here. That statement right there, after all we just said about the old covenant passing away, and then here's Christ, the new wine's got a new covenant. What in the world? How come Jesus is saying to this guy, if you would ever enter life, keep the commandments? That's, that's the law. Why is he saying that? And he, the, the young man, said to him, which ones? That's kind of a curious statement. Uh, and Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these I have kept, what do I still let, lack? There's probably more to it than I understand about the order in which Jesus uh, um, quoted those, those commandments. It's interesting. He leaves out uh, the last one, you shall not covet. And, and 
that probably has something to do that he's de dealing with this with this rich this rich man. But what we're seeing here then is the law meeting the gospel. This man's religion was the law, and, and we should say that more accurately. This man's religion was the misuse of the law. His religion was the misuse of the law because the law was never given to justify anyone. And yet that is what he's doing. That's the religion that Paul, when he was Saul of Tarsus, when he was the Pharisee, that's what the Pharisees were, you know, they were seeking to establish their own righteousness. And the law was never never given for that purpose. What is the purpose of the law? Here, here it is, and this is what you know, Paul means. Like, don't you listen to the law? You want to be under the law? Do you know what the law is? 2 Corinthians 3. This, this one just hammers it. Paul says, now, if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone, okay, what is the purpose of the, of the law, of the old covenant? It is to kill and condemn. It is a, he calls it, it is a ministry of death. A ministry of death. Carved in letters on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end. Will not the ministry of the Spirit, the new covenant, have even more glory? For if there was glory in the Ministry of condemnation. The ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. This is a really good little passage to keep handy. You know, when you're talking to people and they're talking about, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I think God sees me generally as a, as a good person. Well, what they're doing, you can show them as well. Then you're saying that you're doing a, you're approaching God based upon works, Ten Commandments, whatever. Did you know that the Bible tells us that the Ten Commandments are a ministry of death, they are a ministry of condemnation? That's what they are. That's, that's why they were given to kill. They were given to condemn. They were given to curse. And, that, and those things are good. But obviously, no one will ever be justified by, by the Old Covenant. So when this man comes up to Jesus and he says, What good deed must I do to have eternal life? He betrays the religion that, that he is uh, worshiping God, supposedly serving God in. And Jesus jumps all over him for this uh, business of his use of this little seemingly harmless term. Good, right? Good. Luke says that, um, this, is, this is what the guy said more fully. A ruler asked him, he comes up to Jesus, this is the rich young ruler, Luke 18. Good teacher. He didn't say teacher, he said good teacher. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And there's the fundamental truth this is what the Old Testament, the law, was given as a ministry of death, as a ministry of condemnation, to show us, you know what? I'm not good. Nothing I do is good. Only God is good. And this presents a real dilemma. I am condemned. I am under curse. Do you find it curious in... I think maybe it's in Deuteronomy, but when um, Moses had reiterated the law to the Israelites, and you know how quickly they would say, all that you have spoken, we will do. All that you have spoken. And, and, and Moses, right from the beginning, he says, you will not be able to serve him. You, you won't be able to do it. You're going to fail. You can't do it because he is a holy God and you are an, un, an unholy God and unholy people. And that was the purpose of, of God giving the law. Its primary purpose, at, at least, is to show us in our sin, we are not good. Only God is good. And this presents a problem. 
Because if that which is unholy ever meets he who is perfectly holy, well, hell is the, is, is the result, right? Isn't this, think about this now, isn't this young man's religion the religion of the mass of mankind today? It's, a, it's man's favorite religion. Uh, in Romans 10, Paul says, Moses writes about the righteousness that's based on the law. Okay, so all false religion. Righteousness based on the law. Now, sometimes they'll point to the Ten Commandments or they'll come up with their own commandments or whatever rules or whatever it is, but I'm, by keeping these rules, doing this, not doing this, I'm making myself righteous then before God, whoever, whoever he is. Moses writes about the righteousness that's based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, don't say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. And what Paul, what Paul means there is people like this young ruler, you know, who see themselves as quite good, and his religion is, is keeping the law, works of the law, is what they're saying is, I will ascend into the presence of God. And if a Savior is needed, I, 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 will, I will handle that. I'll, I'll bring him down. And if he needs to be raised from the dead, to bring him up, well, I'll, I can do that too. I will, I will handle it. Oh, really? Really? So what man needs is God to come down and walk among us, reveal himself to us, take our sins upon himself, die and be buried, and then be raised from the dead. Again, that is the only way of salvation. And what the, what, whether they know it or not, the person who is pursuing the works of the law as righteousness before God is saying, I can do that. I can do that. I'll, I'll go up there and get him, and then bring him down here, and then I'll, 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 I will raise him. I will raise him up again. I'll, I'll be good enough. But in fact, what does the law do? It condemns, it curses, and it empowers sin. And this is why Jesus deals with this young man the way that he does, because he's, he is showing him the requirements of the religion, the false religion that this man is, is, is choosing. Oh, you, so you want eternal life? You, you, want to be, you want to be perfect? Then keep, keep these commandments. And the, the guy comes back, he still doesn't get it. You know, he still comes out, oh yeah, I've, I, I've done all that. And so then Jesus brings it on home with the final blow. If you would be perfect, oh, it's like, like really, really, You've loved your neighbor as yourself, huh? Hmm. If you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. What was the truth of the matter? He hadn't kept any of the commandments. Not a single, not a single one of them. He was a worshiper of his own idol, which was his own riches, and in loving those riches, he, he um, did not love his neighbor as himself. Now, I would suspect, as, the, as Pharisees did, you know, that he probably put some token money at the, into the temple depository and with maybe with trumpets sounding and, and so on, and do, it goes through those external measures of, of supposedly keeping the law. But Paul says in Romans chapter 7 that the law is spiritual. And that's interesting. The Old Testament, the Ten Commandments are spiritual. What, what does that mean? It means they have to be obeyed from the heart, not just externally. They have to be obeyed from the heart. Romans 7, did that which is good then bring death to me? The law? The law is good. 
By no means it was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, that's what the law does, and through the commandment might be sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. In other words, what Paul, what Paul was saying there is that I finally realized that the law is spiritual. It's not just a bunch of rules that I outwardly do my best to keep, but I finally at one day got down to the 10th commandment, you shall not covet. And I realized coveting is something that comes from the heart. And it dawned on him, I haven't kept the law at all. I, I'm, completely, I'm completely condemned because the law is spiritual, you see. And not just words carved on stone. And so Jesus met this rich young ruler in terms of the law to show him that his religion condemns him. That he was not good. That his arrogant attempts to make himself good by the law were foolishness. And until this man confessed all that and turned from it and followed Christ, he would remain condemned and headed for eternal death. And that is the choice that he made. I think it's over in Luke, either in Luke's account of this uh, incident or Mark's, where um, we are told <coughs> that Jesus loved this young man. He loved this young man. This is an, it is an act of love to show the, uh, the unsaved, to show the sinner the law, to show them their, their, co their condemnation, you see. But this truth is one that flies in the face of supposedly nice people that we meet uh, daily, face to face. And it is something that um, is skirted around in most of the, ch of the churches then, today. We want to plan next time, as I said, to look at this, uh, this kind of shocking uh, truth that Jesus talks about. But uh, in, in regard to uh, rich people and, and entering the kingdom of heaven and, and so on and the reaction of the disciples. But I wanted to close with, with this challenge. Uh, this is a related passage from Matthew 16. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, and this, this is what he's telling this, this young man, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Well, God, here I am standing before you on my dying day. I got a whole pile of money here, and I would just like to buy my soul. I would like to enter it. And of course, it isn't, it isn't, going, to, it isn't going to work. Now, it's easy for us to be deceived here. Because in our day, we don't, you know, Jesus isn't like, like here's this, this young man. Jesus was right, he was there. He was face to face talking to him. And Jesus is telling him, do this. Sell your stuff and come and follow me. And you'll have riches in him. You'll have eternal, eternal life. Come and follow. And then Jesus, you know, the rich young man, he, he walks away. They separate, all right? So the decision is obvious. Is obvious. If he's going to go with Jesus, he's got to do what he says. He's going to have to sell this stuff and be rid of it and, and get rid of his idol and go follow Jesus. It was decision time, and the decision was plain. There he goes. He walks away. In our day, Jesus isn't physically standing right in front of us. And so there's all kinds of people, you know, it's almost become kind of the, these buzzwords crop up in the church all the time. So... Now, instead of saying you're a Christian, it's, it's vogue to say, I'm a, I'm a Jesus follower. I'm a Christ follower. It's an accurate term, but, um, but in fact, uh, many, many, many people, probably even most people that claim they are Christ followers, are not following Christ then um, at all. But they can fake it. You can fake it now. You, know? you can say, I'm, I'm oh yes, I'm... I am a Christ follower. And so to bring it home to us, 
individually by way of challenge and application, let's put this question to ourselves. If Jesus were standing right in front of you, or me, as he was with this rich young man, and he said to you, come, follow me, and you'll have eternal life, and then he started walking away from you, what would it be that's tugging at you to try to keep you there? That's what is what went wrong with, with Lot's wife, wasn't it? It was. Even, Sodom was tugging at her. Right? She, was, she was looking back. So what would it be that would be tugging at you? You have to be ruthlessly honest with yourself here. But what would it, what would it be? And would it succeed? Would it, is it keeping it? Because here's the truth of the matter. The Lord Jesus Christ is present with you right now. And he is calling upon you to leave whatever he wants you to leave behind and, and follow him. And that thing that you cherish is tugging at you to pull you back to itself instead of you going with Jesus. And you are making a decision just as that young man did. I hope it's not the decision that he made, but Christ's call to us and his requirements of us are every bit as real. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for Christ. Thank you for your, your grace and your mercy. Thank you for the righteousness that comes to us by faith alone and that we need not be, uh, we may, need not remain under the, the curse and condemnation of the law. And Father, we pray that you would open our eyes to see anything that uh, we're trying to drag along that you would have us jettison uh, as we follow you. And we pray this in Christ's name.